Attention all neurodivergents. Are you tired of feeling overwhelmed by loud noises and crowded environments? Well, D-Buds are a first of their kind game-changing earplugs with volume adjustable technology. D-Bud earplugs can help reduce sensory overload, help you focus and make your environment a lot more manageable. I've been using D-Buds the past few months now and they've really been amazing out and about at the gym and pretty much any time I'm not listening to music. If you're interested in giving them a go, my affiliate link is always down in the description. Use code 40 40 for a 20% discount. Good day and welcome back to the 40 40 podcast with your host, Mr. Thomas Henley, of course. And today I've got another very, very special episode for you. And in fact, it is special because it's the first time we're doing an in-person podcast. And I am joined today by my very lovely mother, who's going to talk to, well, talk to me about um, some of the experiences that she had with me growing up as an autistic child through teenagehood, going to university, doing all my sporting events and competitions and hopefully give you guys a bit of an insight into my life um, from a different angle. Yeah, so um, how are you doing today? I'm good. It's good to be here. Hi, everybody. Hello. So um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your uh, your background? Like, I know that, well, obviously you're, you're my mom, um, <laughs> but a little bit about what you do. Like, uh, okay, it's good that you pointed that out. I'm just going to say sorry to everybody for my voice. I've got some voice difficulties. So bear with me. I'm going to do my best with this one. So um, obviously, first and foremost, I'm Tom's mum. Very proud of Tom and everything he's been achieving and um, working on the um, podcast and doing all the speeches and just raising that up acceptance of autism mm -hmm. in the community in the wider world which is great <clears throat> so I started off in the 90s as a primary school teacher I became aware of autism through my teaching and um, I've kind of progressed to be oh, I'm struggling. Sorry. it's okay don't worry <laughs> about it well yeah many of you will know <laughs> that um, I talk about my mum a lot on on the podcast because mm. she's been such a um a big supporter of me and a big inspiration for me uh growing up um i'm very lucky to have such a a strong family support network and um my mum's been incredibly key in helping me develop socially also with following my dreams things that i want to do um i know that as, as my mum said it's you know you She's been struggling with uh, her voice for quite a while. Um, what what happened with that? I can't remember what it was called. <laughs> yeah, I have vocal dysphonia, so the vocal cords are quite uh, not moving as they should be, so they're a bit yeah. squeaky. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I was a special needs teacher and then went on to be head of SEND for a local authority, so I kind of looked at things from the other side. But I worked with parents on so out each to support their children in school and I also worked um, on doing parent training and also training for our staff in schools to better support children and their needs in the mainstream. And you've, you've been doing a lot haven't you because um, mm -hmm. I remember you know you used to sort of be um, you kind of you went for a, a period of time didn't you where you were um, working sort of at, a, at one of like the local special needs schools that we had. Um, and then I think you, you took up like a, a really sort of out of the box, um, high, you know, very high up job within SEND education. I think you were the, like the, um, the, the manager of the SEND manager for Red Car in Cleveland. Or? Yeah, the strategic head of SEND. Strategic yeah. head of SEND. So, I think I think after a while it was it was quite an intense job, mm. wasn't it? So it was. It was. It was. <laughs> it was see, there's the other side of things in terms of getting provision for children we sent and making sure schools were trained up in the way that they should be and kind of 
linked together the special schools and on all sides the main streets to make sure the provision was good. Yeah, well, I think think one of the reasons why you you decided to leave that job was because you you missed working with the kids and stuff. And I I, I agree with you. I mean, mm. when like the first job that I ever had was um, within special needs. Mm. Um, I would work as like a special needs mm. teaching assistant, as you know. Um, and I really missed that. Missed the kids. Um, it wasn't really a job for me because it was very um, taxing on me. Quite stressful. <laughs> I, quite stressful. Yeah. Um, and the working days are very long. Uh, well, not long, but they were very sort of intense. And you have to be like, as a teacher, you have to be very like switched on and like uh, planning things and sort of. I, I found it really, really hard. But I, I do miss a lot of the kids that I used to to work with. Yeah. So I understand why you you decided to kind of go back and have a bit more of that local. Oh, that, that's what makes me smile walking through the door and see the young people. And, yeah. they, and they said, and our children are so unique and so, so pure of heart, really, and mm. just absolutely amazing in everything they do. And it just, it just brings you back to ground and what's going on and, I was a bit too far removed in my previous job, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It was, you're having sort of an impact mm. on like the the frameworks and mm, yeah, sort yeah. of, uh, but it was very detached, wasn't it? It was from the families and the children, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I know today we're here to kind of go, go a little bit through, through my life. <laughs> um, from I guess from a different angle because I get a lot of questions from people especially during my live streams um who ask me like a lot of questions about me as a as a youngster but you know just part and part because I was so young I don't really remember much about it um I think the earliest memory that I can really think about was when I went to, when, when we went to get like an autism diagnosis for me um I remember that quite vividly um, obviously, we'll we'll get into that in a little bit, but I guess um, starting off, I mean, looking back on my early childhood, mm-hmm. what signs of autism did you first sort of see in me, and what encouraged you to go and get um, a diagnosis for me in the first place? Okay, well, I thought I was absolutely smashing it at being a mum because I had this perfect little baby who was slept routinely and woke every four hours and wouldn't sort of make a move, wouldn't cry when he wanted feeding, wouldn't cry when he did his, you know, obviously messed his lap in whatever. Um, I Thanks for that. Did you <laughs> well, you ask your mum to come on, Tommy. You know, it's true. Okay, you're going to get this, yeah, guys. Sorry. Go, go for it. Go so, for it. Um, <laughs> so, so I've I thought, oh, wow, I mean, it must be amazing first time, Mum, I'm absolutely smashing this. What I didn't realise was that was very early signs of Thomas not communicating to me his needs right from being tiny. That young. Right from being a newborn. However, as he got older, things started to change a bit. And um, we saw kind of no motivation to kind of move or kind of things or he would become very fixated with lights in particular mm. and that's still the same today isn't it Tom? Yeah. So we have an abundance of lights and sensory lights around the house which is lovely actually it's really nice and calming but something that really helps Tom a lot I'm just going to have a drink guys it's all right. Yeah I, th- I think it's um. <clears throat> so like because I, I imagine that with with most like babies and kids, they would they would have mm. that sort of mm. ignition to like let people mm. let 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 the parents know that they need something. I think um, I've spoken to a lot of parents with with autism, and I think until you have your second child, you think it's the norm. Yeah, and you kind of. Are quite intuitive with your own child, so you just kind of carry on and adapt your life and adapt the things around your child. But it's only maybe when you have your second child or somebody actually unpicks it and points out the differences that you're 
doing that and maybe a bit unusual, like cutting your child's hair up at night time when they're asleep. Oh, right, yeah. Because I do remember that for that part yeah. of things. So you ended up with a lovely little bowl cut quite yeah. often, which uh, I think you've improved on the on the hairstyles now. Yeah, it's so. um I do I do remember I think I just I found like hairdressers mm-hmm. and dentists mm-hmm. and um like hospitals and stuff really hard. I think mm-hmm. like I, I do actually remember the situation. I went to one one barber's and there was like mm-hmm. loads of lights and loads of people around and there was like I could hear all the hairdressers and I remember just being in a very sort of like I I, I remember somewhat aspects to aspects to that to that experience. I can't remember which when it was, but I think you were about four. We were about four. Mm. Um but I, I found the mm. the that that hairdressers mm. and going to it really, really hard, but also like the stuff around like the clipping of mm-hmm scissors around my ears mm. i felt really i was nervous about someone accidentally cutting me but i was also i d- just didn't really like the like the sound of it for some reason so highly sensory though isn't it it's yeah just a sensory overload in itself but i think once we'd kind of gone through finding somebody that would kind of follow you around and somebody that was very gentle and mm. understood and I had a low sensory environment. We were able to get your hair cut, but I was sat outside the barber's the other day, looking in at Tom because I went to pick him up. I didn't stalk him outside. <laughs> so I was sat outside watching him, just thinking, "Oh my goodness, you know, this is actually huge." Because all these years later, he's able to actually enjoy going to have his hair. Cut. Oh yeah, I like it. It's it's like a social. And we'll sit there looking in the mirror with everything thing. that used to happen. Absolutely, just make your life a mystery. The the re- I think the the, the mm. biggest reason why there was such a shift in that is because mm. I I went to a um a barber in Manchester, mm. and I I intentionally I went there. I wasn't expecting mm. it to be too bad, but um it was a bit like the the barber was like a very aggressive with like the tugging and stuff, and I used to like go away with like watery eyes, and I even got like my eyebrows threaded and stuff as well. Because I, I kind of, I I use that place as like a way to like desensitize myself to it a little bit. Um, might not have been the best the best approach to it because it was very very difficult. But I think now now that I found like a a hairdresser that's quite understanding about like my sensory needs, um, it's a lot easier for me and it, it doesn't worry me as much. I think it's just being exposed to it, isn't it? It's just. I think that's really key, actually, because quite often when I've spoken to, it's not a criticism of any parent, but quite often a lot of parents kind of say, well, they can't do that because they have autism. And Mm. I think from your early start, I used to sort of say, right, we're going to give this a go. When I, I think maybe I was a bit kind of blasé about it, we said, right, we're going to give everything a go. Just say you've had experience of it and we'll move away from it if you're not happy. So we just gave everything a go and um, didn't put a ceiling on your um on the things that you could do. Mm. So you kind of desensitized over time. But I think the biggest thing for me was um there were a few very subtle things, like you would sit and do repetitive hand movements well, like when you were a little boy. You would sit, Go and just <laughs> sit like this, just for hours doing that, yeah. and you would spin on the floor. And you would never get dizzy, but you didn't reach your milestones such as crawling. Mm. So some children kind of take their time and build up skills whereas Tom would like not do it and then all of a sudden he would crawl yeah. and then he wouldn't walk and then all of a sudden he got up and walked and then but the one thing was he didn't have a speech delay a bit I think I've got a weird speech delay <laughs> than anybody, delay now. Than anybody. <laughs> uh, he wasn't delayed in his speech at all and actually his speech was really well developed. His cognitive ability, his learning was 
really, really used to good. read a lot. Really early. Oh, he would sit and repetitively go through, sit with your granddad actually and just go through piles oh. of books when he was about two or three and just go through all the books for hours. Really good focus, but then when he went to school, because it was a different environment, different expectations and pressures, he actually stopped reading and ended up going in a group to kind of help him to read. So it's a bit of a shock. Yeah, so I kind of had I those... I kind of understand it now, but I didn't understand it at the time. I've learned a lot more as I've gone along mm. and that was a big shock to me because you were doing so well and enjoyed it. You just you're supposed to go to school to develop those skills, aren't you? So you are, but not, not regress. everything else was so overwhelming, mm. that kind of stripped back. And a lot of parents talk about children losing skills. And they do, but sort of things kind of take precedence. They do lose the skills, but then they make the skills up again. And the skills do come back quite often mm. in most cases. Yeah. But you can all hear me, okay? <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure it'd be okay. Um, okay. Yeah, there's something that you said about, um, mm. like, um, so the the, the speech the speech delay because the speech delay is something that I get asked about a lot by mm. by as I said people either in comments or sort of um, mm. sending me messages or, or asking me on lives. Um, when when did I start speaking? When's like the milestone that most people... It was really early. So you started sort of seven, six, seven months. To... Wow. And you didn't say mum or dad, dad. You said Bob Bob, which was oh, the, dog. the dog's name, <laughs> which was a bit disappointing for me. But, <laughs> but you did lots of babbling. And that's kind of the difference between kind of autism, well, typical autism, I suppose, and the Asperger's diagnosis as it was. Hmm. Uh, actually, there was no speech delay, so that was kind of one of the differences that I first picked up on with mm. folks. Because I thought, oh, we can't be autistic because they also got a speech delay. Mm. But it's the different variants within autism, and as we know, everybody is completely different in their presentation, as we all are. Yeah, yeah. Mm. What about like the social elements? Because that's that's mm. something that I think we haven't. Touch on like how did I get on with other kids around that kind of early early age? Okay, so one of the things you did, you were always a bit of a watcher. You mm. would you would kind of a preschool. I remember Mary saying to me, he always stands back and he watches, and then he kind of copies and takes part. <laughs> um, but you were always very wary, but. What you did do, you were very gentle and lovely with other children when you went to play group, but it was always learned responses and learned behaviours. So you would mm. watch me with your brother, and I was, if it was crying, I'd always go, Oh, poor baby, poor baby. So whenever someone cried or anything else in settings sort of outside the home, I was going, Oh, poor baby, <laughs> and would kind of tap. Kind of a really, <laughs> it was a really learned response, but he dealt with it that way. So, yeah. So early on, kind of four to five, mm. you were really not sociable, but you would have friends. You would go to parties mm. and um, to be more of kind of the sidelines, yeah. kind of yeah, yeah, just observing and on the sidelines observing, but us. If somebody came to the house from a very early age, we had to say to Thomas, Thomas, stop, say hi to Grandad, or can you look, say hi to uh, whoever, because it would just look at the objects in the room and not the people. So we had to kind of do a lot of work on awareness. And it was really um, had a kind of real attack with being with me and would really struggle if I would left the house yeah. and I think that's just kind of because it was unpredictable because it was change and mm. so, so I remember you saying sorry. about like Nana mm. 
like when when our when my grandma used to come round, I'd like yeah, like shut shut the door on her and tell her to tell her to go back to her house. Well, you did because I was going to work, so it meant change. Somebody else was coming to my house. Yeah. You'd say, you go to your house, I go to mine. <laughs> <laughs> but Roald Banner got the door closed on her, but never. Did, did, she go did, did she? Did she know much? Like, was she was she very, like, aware of that I stuff, think, or was she just kind of... I think she struggled to understand it, because she would come in and say, I've got a surprise for you, and you would go, oh, and you'd have a meltdown, because she didn't like surprises. No, you no. liked predictability. Yeah. He liked to know exactly what you were doing, where you were going. But, of course, people typically think you could love surprises and you yeah. didn't. So that was a big, that was a big difficulty, really. Mm. But she got, she got the kind of, she loved you, so she got to, to know what you could cope with and what you couldn't. Mm. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. So, mm. yeah. And what, about, what about, like, the... Um... So we, we talked a bit about like the signs of autism, autism yeah. mm-hmm. when I was younger. I mean, I know I I just be really interested. In, like, what was like the the tipping point? Because I know that I was diagnosed when I was about ten. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, what was kind of the the ignition to to going and getting the diagnosis? Because, as you said, like you, you know, I I imagine you kind of look back. From from mm-hmm. when I was that age and look back on signs of seeing seeing it when it, in in myself when I was mm-hmm. little. Mm-hmm. Um, but what was like the sort of the point where you were like, oh hey, actually, we might actually have to go mm-hmm. get a diagnosis. Yeah. And, yeah. and what held you back from doing it before? Okay, so I think um, maybe I was quite naive. I mean, my think originally because I thought that because we were able to uh, modify and kind of support you, make adjustments, you know, make sure that everything, your world was okay, that everybody would. Yeah. And um, to some extent, primary school did, but um, maintaining friendships was really hard for you so we would have to do a lot of kind of um supporting with friend- when friends came around with structured activities and mm. things like that you struggled to just free play because you were quite possessive over your toys as well yeah I, I remember that especially with my brother yeah, <laughs> really hard to share because of course it's a social skill and we had to do quite a lot of work on that um so I think the key thing for me was when you went up to be year five, year six in um, junior school and um, <clears throat> you had a teacher who was quite sarcastic and a lot of teachers, you know, do use sarcasm. It's like humor. We all use mm-hmm. We all use sarcasm through humour. And it's a good thing to learn, but actually because you were quite, literal in your thinking and in your language you really struggled with that and it kind of made you and I remember your teacher describing you as the class clown I I, yeah think, I remember that Tom, the class clown that doesn't kind of work for me it's not who Tom is it's really and it was like I wonder why that was happening you know so friends <laughs> So, actually, what Tom was doing was friends were putting him in a position where he he would do what they told him to do and then he would get the repercussion and he would make a fool of himself. Sorry. No, <laughs> no, no. I, I remember that, like, especially, oh. like, at parties and mm-hmm. things like that or at school then where... He would get the, you would get the blame. Yeah, like but, you went to a party, mm. your friends told you to call this girl a name and you ran around shouting this name and then didn't realise what the repercussions were. And um, We had a lot of incidents like that where people were kind of, I'm not saying you were perfect, because no, you weren't, no. no kid is perfect, but there were a lot of situations where the social skills just weren't just were kicking in and then obviously hormones were kicking in. Um, the friendships became more complex. 
looks like That's you were kind of being left behind. You were a couple of years behind your peers in terms of your social skills. Yeah. So um, it started to get a bit of bullying creeping in. There was a little bit of tussle with friendships. And actually you started to withdraw a little bit and your behaviours became more rigid. And when I was... Sorry, I'm just going to have a drink. It's all right. I do, I do, because um, I, I kind of, um, you know, in, in my head, I felt like I was kind of more my sort of genuine self when I was a lot younger. Like, I felt a lot more free and loving and expressive when I was younger, but I, I remember going sort of around that sort of age, going into, around the age where I go into secondary school or perhaps the end of primary school, that I felt... I guess a little bit. I don't know. I just, I just, I, I, I just became very sort of withdrawn in myself, and I didn't. I was questioning a lot, like my my interactions with other people, and I found it very hard to grasp exactly what was going on in situations. Yeah, I mean, I think you were being sucked down a tunnel. Really, I think it's like one of those psychedelic tunnels where you just like. Everything's going on around you, and you kind of didn't know where you fitted. Yeah. Um, and I think when you start to move back through that tunnel, it kind of became more withdrawn, which you never had been before. And um, but I think, more importantly, the school were not understanding, and I kind of got a very negative response at one point, and I went in with the Zencoda practice. And I was told there was nothing that could be done for you because you were very academic. And I hear this a lot, and a lot of parents hear this, that actually their child is okay at school and doing well and coping, and actually it's not okay to just cope. No, it's, it's not a... Coping means you're on the edge and you're kind of teetering. Actually, no, you need to be supported and progressed and feel comfortable and not just cope because that leads to mental health difficulties it's not just about the academic side as well no. with school like there's a there's a big heavy social element of you know de developing that social emotional mm. side is quite important around that that kind of well, formative huge. years you know it's absolutely huge if you don't know if you don't have a connection with how you feel and you can't name it and know what's going on in your body and how do you form relationships with other people mm. and kind of progress with that i think with boundaries as well like mm, setting boundaries. boundaries was really mm. you know it's it's only something that i really understood when i got into sort of late mm. late teens early ad adulthood it's kind of mm. you know i i didn't really understand you know, I thought that that being difficult or putting boundaries in place or getting upset at people was inherently just a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I felt very strongly that any show of anger or dismissal was like a bad a bad thing in every single circumstance. So it's kind of like I wasn't, I didn't allow myself to be upset with friends, I guess, as much. Mm -hmm. Um were quite a passive a passive young man and you'd always you'd always sort of pick up on different sort of tones you got with me at the moment but <laughs> if my voice changed you always thought it was because I was angry with you yeah oh. so it kind of went the other yeah, way as like I didn't yeah. notice it and then yeah. I did notice it mm. but I didn't know how to exactly what to do about mm. that you know sure, like or sure understanding it, i guess in like the whole picture of like the mm. context of it i guess yeah and i think um sort of moving to the other side as well kind of looking after yourself you struggle to kind of know the routines of how to shower so that executive mm. function inside so we spent probably about a year year and a half kind of having routines in place mm. for you to be able to shower because if we change the shampoo you thought it was a different it wasn't shampoo anymore yeah. if we kind of well, we realized that the um, visual pictures didn't work for you but actually lists that you we could go and take off and I still use and that <laughs> 
and visuals really worked and then it just became embedded and then mm. you do it um, so that worked really well and it was a friend that said to me you do realize that not everybody does this don't you and I thought no actually I know they don't and um, uh, I think you know a discussion obviously between Tom's dad he was very you know it's very supportive and so I think the lead up to the diagnosis was mainly because I knew you were coping and I thought actually moving into secondary as a lot of our parents I know do as the child is moving into secondary you kind of want you know it's a bigger bond and you know that there's a big there's going to be lots of teachers it's dealing very with you in different social ways. interactions hugely complex I thought actually I need a piece of paper to let people know what is formally that you need and what is what's happening? There was also a side of me that felt really guilty. I thought, is it something I've done as a parent? And you're sort of blaming yourself like for the struggles guilt, that I had. Huge guilt. And I know you dad did as well, thinking that actually something was wrong. I didn't do something. I wasn't loving enough. I wasn't... Actually, I knew I was a loving parent. I know that we were warm parents. Yes, that, that, oh, that whole say. stigma around like the refrigerator mother hypothesis. Oh, I can't bear that. I can't bear that. <laughs> total nonsense. If, if, if you don't know what refrigerator mm-hmm. parents, it's like, um, I think it was like a hypothesis that someone came up with. Autism, yeah. That, that someone autism. that people yeah. ran with, whereby autism was not like, as we know, like a yeah. neurodevelopmental thing. It was more. Um, if if your parents didn't show you love or interact with you or you know engage in like physical contact and stuff with you that it would cause children to become withdrawn and more autistic and it's complete it's complete bollocks but <laughs> I, I, I agree yeah and uh, so if there's any mums out there feeling guilty or dads don't because this is not your fault and that's a really big thing to take away and you're doing a great job and I always think the the best children, the children that need the most, come to the right people and the right parents. So just keep doing what you're doing. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And um, you know, I was, I was saying about before before we sort of got into talking. I mean, mm. um, one of one of the sort of key sort of stages in my life or key mm. moments in my life was when you told me that I was autistic, like. Well, did you did you know that when you were going to get the diagnosis that you'd tell me by a certain age, um, and like how how did you go about sort of framing it? Because I do remember that it was kind of framed more as like a neutral thing, rather than something inherently negative or inherently positive. Like how did you how were you what were your thoughts around like telling me that? I think. When we got the diagnosis, I was I was quite teary and quite really selfishly quite relieved that it wasn't me that had caused no. that. Actually, it you was, got that stigma around. It was yeah. something that was happening or had happened, and it was who you are. You know who you are, and uh, we had to learn and grow with that. And uh, it was okay, but we just had to make other people aware of it. Yeah. Um, in retrospect, I probably would have done more work around it. Knowing what I know today, I would have done a better job at um, supporting you with the diagnosis. But that's in hindsight. So we decided as soon as you got the diagnosis, we would go and tell you immediately. So we took you to McDonald's. You yeah, know, I, I took you to McDonald's. Chicken nuggets, sat happy meal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we... Um, sat down and we talked about you know why we'd had the meetings why you'd gone to see this lady and blah 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 and um we said so you've um, you've got something called autism which makes you think a little bit differently and um makes you feel differently and maybe you see the world through at different different classes almost and um and you just kind of looked at us and smiled and you went oh that that's why that's why I feel differently and I'm, that's why I do the things that I do and you just kind of took a big sigh and almost 
it's like a weight was lifted off your shoulders. Bob, it's like something had just clicked into place and you were just like, so okay, I, I, I do, I did, I'm good, I'm okay with that. I did <laughs> recognise, even though, even at that, mm. that time that I was, something was different, mm. like just from my interactions with other kids and... Um, mm. I don't know. It's just kind of an, a feel of feeling of just being like a bit of an alien. Mm-hmm. Like it, it was very hard for me to put on exactly mm-hmm. why, but I just, I, I remember just feeling completely overwhelmed and mm-hmm. like everything that was happening around me was just so complex. Even with like kids my age, it yeah. was, yeah, yeah. it was hard for me to have it, have any sort of clarity on what was happening to me. I felt, I felt, a little bit like I was in a different universe. Mm, definitely. And I think other parents were also saying things like, oh, Tom gave the tea and he sat under the table at the dinner table. <laughs> it was very odd. But I kind of went with it and it was like, well, he doesn't like sat opposite with the icon. Yeah, yeah, him. yeah. It was all too much, too much social at the table and noise, but... We had some parents that were really supportive and supportive friends and others that were just like, oh, you know, move away, don't be his friend kind of thing, which yeah. is social exclusion. Disgusting, mm. disgusting, quite frankly, some of the things that I know a lot of parents come across, really, and it's hard. It's really hard. That's a big thing, isn't it? The, the, mm. the willingness mm. of parents to kind of integrate. Mm. Like, there's a lot of social exclusion a lot, a lot, a lot from other kids, but also like from parents as well, who parents of neurotypical children. Like, we were really lucky because you always, you're a lovely little boy, and you always got invited to the parties hmm. and so forth. The, the network of mums were really good. But I hear of you know, if you could do one thing, just invite that little person who is sort of seeming like that. A fish out of water in the playground, just invite them to a party. They may not be able to cope, they may not come, but just invite them. Yeah. You know, it will make them feel more included and the parents as well, who are probably going through a really tough time. So it's just to have that thought, really, isn't it? And mm. just, I don't know, that just sends off. I think a lot of parents, they get, they get a bit, mm. I mean, humans in general, just from. Mm any type of discrimination it's a lot of it's based on not understanding and not and being scared or you know it's sort of ignorance and also um but it's so damaging it can be so damaging it Mm. really can it really really can i'm very sad and it's not great but the special school that I work at at the moment, so I look at our amazing young people and I just think they're so vulnerable. You know, it needs to be a community. We need to be a community mm. supporting each other, not just kind of pushing out the people that we don't want. You know, we're all different. And I think, I think that's a big issue, but especially sort of in modern mm. times with the advent of social media and online things. Mm, like communities thing. are becoming very atomised, like... People are becoming more more seeing themselves as individuals rather than parts of the community. Like you go to smaller communities around, and perhaps they have a lot more. Like they have like weekly church like meetings and stuff where they they invite all the like the members of the community to to talk and chat and build that community up. But I don't really see that a lot of that um, nowadays. It seems seems to be very broken up. Like it is. And um, I think that support is really important, particularly for parents, to just have a chat, just know you're not isolated mm. and that other people are going through the same thing as you are. And that's okay. And it's just a different way of life. It's a different way of living. And your children are amazing. And mm. you just want to share that, you know, because our young people and our children do amazing things. And, you know, Tom's proof of that. Really for me. Stop it. Proud mum moments, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I mean, what, what, um, it's going a bit, a bit, bit further into it. I mean, did you have any difficulties when it came to parenting with me? And hmm. I guess, like, was, was there any, like, individuals, any kind of, 
I don't know, speakers or role models or um, parenting groups, which kind of informed your opinion? Because I feel like a lot of parents nowadays, especially with, you know, the the types of practices that a lot of autistic people um, feel very negatively towards and, uh, and don't agree with. Um, whereas my, my experience of parenting fr from your side and also your um, style of teaching, it seems to be a lot more kind of holistic and a lot more individualized mm -hmm. as opposed to like trying to fit everyone into programs and mm -hmm. setting like very stringent mm -hmm. milestones and things like that. So yeah, difficulties perhaps with parenting me about certain things and what kind of informed that? Okay, so when um, we were leading up to diagnosis and diagnosis, I read and read and read <laughs> everything that was out there. And um, I think one of the biggest thing, the biggest um, influences was reading Anna Kennedy's book, oh, uh, yeah. Not Stupid, mm -hmm. which was an amazing book if you ever get to read that. I'm an ambassador um, to Anna Kennedy if you want to go check out her work. I was work. very pleased that. So that yeah. happened. It was like coming full circle, really. Yeah. But then also uh, Tony Atwood, mm. uh, because he particularly looked at Asperger's, which Thomas was diagnosed with at the time. I know we've come under one umbrella of autism, but that was a diagnosis, so that's what we looked at. I also read a lot by Wen Lawson, who was Wen Wendy Lawson, who um, did a lot of work on relationships and kind of sexual health as well because I knew obviously Tom was going to go into puberty and kind mm. of there would be other things coming up um pardon the pun <laughs> Jesus Christ <laughs> sorry you're the worst like you, you and dad you're the worst for that kind of stuff <laughs> we'll see something about your generation or something <laughs> <laughs> swiftly moving on. Go, okay, yeah, so, go for it, yeah. So, um, <laughs> so um, uh, I just read and read and read and then obviously was using a lot of strategies in my teaching and um, read a lot, a lot about approaches, you know, particularly kind of um, uh, stringent approaches, particularly coming maybe from America, such as ABA and so forth. And, yeah, I, th um, I think a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of listeners will know what you um, know what you're talking about. And it really wasn't for me, and I just thought actually we have to go from the child and just strip back and know what the child needs and how we relate. So it was more of a relational approach to parenting and to which is how you parent anyway, and, like with. Yeah, it was more explicit to everything we did. We made it explicit. You don't do this because when we're here, we do this because, and we taught you with DMs because one day I said to you, you know, oh, you money puts a hole in your pocket, Tom, and you jumped a mile. So we taught you because you were very literal. <laughs> so we taught you a lot about <laughs> idioms. <laughs> And we did everything very literally. You know, cats and dogs, kind of cats running cats and, and dogs. dogs. <laughs> Absolutely. So we were kind of, um, I think, after settling to your own flow, and I know I wanted you, I said to you one day, well, actually, no, you were in your bunk bed, and you said to me, Mum, would you change me? Would you take my autism away? Which was a really random question. I think you were about 12. It's a very deep question it to was. ask. It. it was a really deep question. You just threw me, really. And of course, I was like, no, because you wouldn't be you. You know, you wouldn't be Tom. And why would I change you just like your brother? Mm. Why I would I that's... change your brother? You know, you are my family. And I, I think that, that, that's just emotion. like, so... it's just, it's something that I think, it, you know, I think that, that sort of mm. approach was was quite important for me i mean i, I went through stages of like, absolutely mm -hmm. hating autism mm -hmm. and myself and i kind of blamed a lot on it but i think you know you're right it's like if you if you make someone not autistic you're changing their brain like mm -hmm. they're not the same person like the the reason why i'm so keen for like 
pers- uh, identity first language and things like that because you know it's it's not like I've lost an arm and that I used to have an arm and it's something that you know it's it, it's I guess it's somewhat a part of my identity in a, in a sense but like it's not as so tied to who I am as like something about about my brain that's different it's not a disease it's no. not a disease is it no. you know it's it's a different way of wiring different way of looking at things and it's a useful way of looking at the world as well through a different lens it really is and we were talking the other night weren't we about normal we were like yeah yeah there really shouldn't be a word called normal because there are so many different variations. You know, we're all unique. We all have a fingerprint. Mm. We're all different. We're all unique. So what is normal? You know, how yeah. do you define that? It really shouldn't be a word, should it? No. But and it, I, I, think, I think there's two ways of kind of looking at it. I mean, mm. I find normal to be a very negative term. It is. Like, I, I agree. Normal is not a compliment or a no. validation. No. Like... The, the most, you know, peop- you want people to be interesting and to have different views on things mm. and to be able to add something to, like, the melting pot of humanity. It's not like, like, if we we're all the exact same person, we would never get anywhere with things. Like, and a lot of, like, the big visionaries and stuff in the world, you know, they, they're often different um, from from most most people. Um and I think for for me, a lot of like my mentality around it is that, you know, I I see we- being strange and weird as and quirky is a good thing. Oh. Like it breaks up the normality of, of boring everyday life, and it allows you to, you know, if if you meet someone who's vastly different from yourself, it's it can often be quite illuminating to like see how they like look at the the world and what they think about things and how they behave. It's um i do i do you know because i think there is a stereotype around like autistic people being really fascinated with like objects and things like but i i i really kind of i didn't really identify with that kind of thing so i remember like reading Mm -hmm. stuff from like temple grandin talking Mm -hmm. about you know we're, we're more fascinated by objects than than people but I, I've always, I don't know if it's something that you you saw, but I've always been incredibly like fascinated with understanding how other people work. Like, well, I think you've always kind of had that need to understand other people and unpick them, and that's been a big motivator in you developing your social skills. But I hmm. think not all people have that. But it's just like we're always told, you know, you teach one person. But one child with autism, you teach one child mm. with autism, mm. you know, everybody is so different. Yeah. But um but I think sort of the things you're doing and the things you're talking about, you know, if you don't have those difficult conversations and kind of challenge things, mm. people never change their thinking. So it's good to challenge and it's good to kind of talk about things that might be really difficult you know and kind of promote that and strike a conversation and a discussion about it Mm. 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 is there anything else that you wanted to add about the difficulties or yeah and i think it's a common one for a lot of parents uh, sleep so oh yeah so oh. when you were a baby, you were very routine and you slept beautifully. Yeah. But as you got older, obviously, I didn't know about melatonin at the time. But um, it's such a big thing with autism, isn't it? It's a huge thing, but you would go to sleep, you wouldn't go to sleep. You struggled to drop off to sleep. Once you were asleep, you were okay. Yeah. It was it's the same, off. same in adulthood as well. Yeah, so um, you used to kind of lay on the bed with you, but... You were very sensory. Is it okay to talk about this? <laughs> Go for it if you so, want. <laughs> so Thomas would always grab me, whether it was me or his dad, would always grab your mouth and kind of squeeze and squeeze and squeeze your lips. And it must have been some sensory thing that it would eventually just drop off to sleep. And it was, I mean, it went on for years and years. <laughs> yeah. 
So many teenage years really that you got prescribed melatonin and yeah. it helped for a short time, but it's not long lasting and you still no. struggle with your sleep, mm. don't you? And we've tried everything, haven't we, really? Yeah, it's just so, I think it's because so, I'm so wired, mm, like I'm so cerebral mm, about everything that I do. Mm, like if I stop doing things and try to mm, like relax in like the typical way. I just get really ang irritable and bored and like it's like my my entire day from waking up till till, till the evening it's like I'm always thinking about something yeah. and, and doing something and when it comes time to sleep it's like I can't really break out of that that kind of way of being uh, to a point where my brain calms down and that I that I fall asleep but I mean I I think I think for me like the most the things that helped me a lot were having something to focus on that didn't require me to think really. Mm -hmm. So I still have like somewhat of a focus on it. It's like nowadays I'll, you know, turn my phone down to the lowest bright brightness and um, turn on like the, the orange light stuff, the, the night screen thing on my, on my phone and just like watch a video or play like a mindless game. And that's, that seems to help a lot. Um, no, I I, th I think that's probably reflected in a lot of things in life, mm -hmm. like the way that you know, like they, they say a lot about you know, go with the flow, go with your gut. Never worked for me. No. It, it almost always causes me a lot of distress, mm -hmm. and it just doesn't work. It's too, uh, it's too loose. It's, it's not literally enough. You know, it's not. Got it's, enough. Also, it's also ba based on emotion mm -hmm. as well. I know. I I think around. Especially when I was younger, I didn't trust at all. Like I, I remember looking at like my friends and people around me and just thinking, mm. I mean, socially, you know, I was behind, but I could still recognize that like some of the behaviors that people were doing and like how they just did stuff because they felt like doing it or they just instantly did things. And I found that really confusing. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't understand why mm -hmm. people did stuff without thinking and knowing why they're doing it thinking it through yeah and i know you never switch off because even when you're in the bathroom you're always listening to research or yeah, yeah. audible like you yeah you never stop really you're always working and then you get the burnout there. that's the only drawback is it? mm. it's the burnout the sensory overload sometimes when you go to events and so forth and you mm. You do really well, and you've um, socialised really, really, really well. And you know you have a good time, but then the next day you're just wiped out yeah. completely. Yeah, you? that you social need, battery. Absolutely, and you just need to have that downtime. And people need to understand that partners, families, just need to not take it so personally. Really, mm. it's not that they don't want to talk to you. It's just that actually, yeah. You just need that, that almost that reset, isn't it? Well, we have like a, a friend of the family who's like, um, <laughs> has like an autistic, autistic daughter, and I absolutely mm -hmm. love her. And mm -hmm. you know, whenever, whenever we mm -hmm. interact or something, we'll have probably like an hour where we'll chat and stuff, but then after a while, we'll just kind of, yeah, sit, just sit in silence and just like yeah. play with some metal or watch something, That's, or yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. it's kind of it's, it's interesting, like with that because it's. I feel like some parents, they feel like they have to do stuff all the time or they have mm -hmm. to teach them all the time or get get them involved and be like really on top of them and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes they, you know, obviously like a lot of the time the best approach is to kind of, you know, tr try and help them um, experience different things, but also, you know, feel okay to, to withdraw and, and pull back when, when you need to. Yeah, sometimes you just need to back off and stop mm. talking. And a lot of teachers find that with autistic children, that when they're having a meltdown, they do more. They say more. They just, ask them questions. Yeah, they, it's like shh. more people come around than. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. yeah. I, like that's really that actually, interesting. Actually, just back off. Yeah. They're kicking you because they want you to move away, and they can't verbally say it at that point. So yeah, it's really important. Yeah. It's really, it's really interesting mm -hmm. as well when I went to these special needs teaching and stuff. Like obviously mm -hmm. in some areas I wasn't yeah. so good with um, 
you know, because I just didn't have the experience with teaching kids and no understanding. Like, um, I think I found it really hard with the thing that I found really hard with teaching is being more authoritarian, like in the yes. way that I that I act. Um, I found that really hard to do. But I, I remember like there's been quite a few times when, you know, perhaps a, a kid that I was working with who, um, you know, they were struggling with mm. something and, and the, the way that they dealt with it was by going towards them and, and separating them from people. Mm-hmm. Whereas what I really tried to do with them was to say that, look, okay, most kids, they're not allowed to go out of the mm-hmm. playground and go to this area. But it is quieter. Does it help you? And mm-hmm. it, does it sound better? Or like, you know, when I saw that they were getting overwhelmed, I was like, do you want to go to the to that area that we go to? And they just kind of sit and they, they count like the stones on the pavement and, you know, um, regulate themselves. Get and it, the world back, yeah. yeah, but also also making them aware of what how how what they're doing is helping their emotional state as well. Because I think. There is a tendency sometimes mm. with autistic kids to try and um, take the reins a little bit with stuff mm. rather than like teaching them how to do, mm. how to like regulate themselves and and what to do and mm. like you know another thing introduce uh, stimming to them mm. like some some uh, you know that quite often you have situations where teachers all try and suppress their stims. Um, but m- more often it's they, they don't introduce things it's not like they go and say hey would you like a video or should we get some lights for the classroom or should we make like a, a sensory den or like they, they don't have that like proactive understanding they're just they're thinking about all oh, the schedule the school schedule we have to get this piece of work done by then and you know, or but... not wanting the child to look different. We used to get told a lot, we don't want to make them look different. It's like, I am different. we're all different <laughs> and this helps me. And I think it was really interesting what you were talking about with the emotional coaching. And that's a really powerful way of getting children to identify their feelings and regulate them mm. more. By just, li- again, be literal and commenting and saying, I can see you look tense. Yeah. I can yeah. see you, you're shaking, or I can see you're kicking because you want me to go away, and that's because maybe you're angry or maybe you feel frustrated. Yeah. You know, and labelling the emotions so that actually they can do something with that and they start to connect. Yeah, what do we, what do, we do when we feel this? We do, exactly. you do this, that helps you, that helped you last time. So we try mm-hmm. that one. And, mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's important. It's very powerful, isn't it? It's Mm. a really powerful thing to do rather than just suppressing everything. Mm. Yeah, actually giving it a label and a name. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's a lot about, like, I guess, sort of my early school experiences. Mm -hmm. But I think there's, you know, there's a a big element to to my story that I think Mm -hmm. is um, harder, uh, more difficult, I guess. Mm. Uh, I'm talking about like my experiences sort of around my secondary school age. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess like <clears throat> I'd like I'd like to I guess understand a little bit more about your perspective on mm. um, situations that I had with, at whether I was at school um, around around my mental health around mm. perhaps my more my, my harming behaviours and sort of um, ideation. Um, mm. I guess, like, was there a point at which you kind of realised that something was a bit, a bit off with me? Like, was it, was it like a one day it kind of clicked and I just didn't talk anymore and I, I, I looked really dysregulated and unhappy, or was it kind of a mm-hmm. gradual? I think uh, this was this was a tough one because we'd always kind of um, had quite. You know, we had this little boy that, you know, would chat, talk, and um, we could kind of guide and support. And then, uh, like I said, you almost went through this tunnel, but went through this tunnel backwards. But all of a sudden, you kind of left. We lost you. Yeah. And it was almost like that. Like an instant kind of. Without me even realising that we'd lost you. And I thought, it's teenage years. And everybody used to say, oh, it's 
it's teenage. It's just hormones. Yes, it's hormones. Yeah. It'll be fine. Whereas I've done a lot of reading and I knew that with Asperger's you could develop mental health difficulties because of high anxiety and social demands and so forth. But I thought, you know, what we've been supportive, you know, he's comes from a nice family and um, we've been supportive. You know, he's got people around him, he's fine, you know, he's just been a teenager. But actually what I didn't see was that you could not find your place. Yeah. You just did not have your place in the world. You did not know where you fitted, so you went from finding your autism diagnosis a relief to absolutely despising it and not wanting anything to do with it and yeah. moving as far away from anything like that as possible, including talking to myself and your dad and people that were close to you, you kind of shut down. Um, the first time I knew about yarning was you used to be a brilliant swimmer. Yeah, yeah. Then all of a sudden you didn't want to go swimming. And you said it we thought it was because of the sudden light coming through, but actually which was one of, probably one of the hardest things for me as a parent was you were actually harming and again it selfishly I thought it's something I've not done or I have done that's caused You're kind that. of putting yourself as the, the blame for it rather than selfishly, yeah, probably. And I didn't quite understand self-harming I didn't I kind of knew that I had to let you do it and as a parent that goes against the grain completely because you want to protect your child mm. and make sure your child's okay but actually you have to just um, make sure all these supports in place and then you kind of move through it I think that's one of the hardest things ever, really. And, um, yeah, yeah, that was difficult. Um, and then we just... Um, the only support we had really was the school nurse. It was great, but the school didn't really understand it. Mm. Secondary school, I'm, I'm saying, didn't understand it. So it was still doing okay um, academically, wasn't it? It was still... It was still career in ahead and that was fine as long as you were performing academically you know actually it's not um you know a priority that you was that you were okay emotionally and that didn't seem to be a priority so there wasn't a great deal of support out there apart from cams and you got referred to cams and you would talk to your health mm. worker but you wouldn't talk to us as a family. To be honest, I didn't which really say fine, much to her either. Which was fine. It's not criticism. You know, you no. had to go through that process, didn't you? But I didn't find it very There helpful. was little guidance and support as parents. There was a very little guidance and support yeah. for you as a young person, if I'm honest. It's better now. And I think if I'd have known about social care and how they could have supported and said, maybe I would have gone down that mm. route to get you a PA or support. But um, I think there was always a stigma with social care that there isn't now that actually social care is a really positive thing to actually add support to the family, you know, and to make sure that... Um, Everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing, and there is a network around you and around the family. So, was the was the person who was supporting me? Were they autism trained? Like, did they know much about autism? No, because I training just didn't really happen at that time at all. No, no, because I just. Um, you know, obviously, I look back with all the knowledge and the research that I've done in adult mm -hmm. life and, mm -hmm. you know, stuff around alexithymia and cognitive empathy and mm -hmm. all sorts of different things. Never was never really touched mm -hmm. on or used in the, in the context of mm -hmm. support that I was getting because I'd come away with these sheets of what to do, like, when I'm anxious or what to do when I've had low mood. And they just... They just didn't work because, like, how am I supposed to regulate my anxiety when I don't know that I'm anxious 
until I'm at the point where I'm having a meltdown or a panic attack. Mm. It's like it just didn't didn't work for me. And I, I, I really felt sort of during those sessions, I, I didn't talk talk to them mm. very much at all, to be honest. I didn't open up about hardly anything because mm. it just kind of felt a bit I just felt like they, they didn't really understand me. And I didn't understand me, but I, I knew that they didn't. Mm. Like, they couldn't really offer me anything that that I felt was... I don't know. I, d- I didn't feel like that they could offer me anything that, that would help. Mm. Um, I think there's some stuff around mm. methods to, like, stop, stop with the harming behaviours, which kind of worked a little bit. But... No, it's it's kind of like one of those situations where I thought I had to kind of go to these and mm-hmm. let them know that I'm okay rather than to talk about the feelings that I was having. I think that also um, there was a lot of bullying going on at school that mm. you again didn't share. No, I didn't. I didn't no. And actually through your podcast, we've kind of got to know about it and sort of sometimes they're a bit heartbroken because we didn't know because... I think you didn't want to share it. So you, I mean, you've said you didn't want to share it. Did no, you? You I didn't tell anybody about it. anything. No, no. Not even like my friends about the bullying and things like that. Mm. It was more like mm. um, it was. Uh, it was. Schools should have picked up on that. Really, they should be more vigilant because of your autism. Really, the only thing that school really did that was quite helpful mm. was they allowed me to go to the to the, um, sort of like the special needs mm. department area that they had. But they didn't do anything with me. Like they didn't mm. support me of anything. They just let me sit in there and have a meltdown. And mm. now and again, I talk to some of the teachers and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it was never something that was like proactively given to me. I had to like seek out the support from the teachers. Um, and some teachers were really bad with um, underst- understanding my, my difficulties and and. Mm allowing me to like go outside when I'm having issues with my sensory stuff and mm. those some teachers were great and some teachers were not so much and I remember one of the one of the issues that I had particularly around PE is that I didn't like to get changed in front of the other the other kids and so I'd always wait until the end of mm. the thing to get changed and I'd always get like told off by like the teachers when I came late to, I did not know that no I didn't know yeah, I, because I was so hyper vigilant about cause the, you know, as mm. you know, the boys, mm. boys changing rooms, they're a bit rowdy, and mm. you know, I was in the top set of PE, so I was with like all the kind of popular football-y kids, and mm. I was just kind of constantly aware of just like mm. that stuff uh, up until a point where I realised that, and everyone started leaving. I was mm. like, oh my god, I haven't got changed, and. <laughs> I'd always get t- told off by like the PE teachers guy. Come on, Tom, like you know, you're always yeah. late. And... <laughs> no sense of urgency. <laughs> no, and I hated PE, and it's it's weird that I hated PE. I know because she did so well. I know. I think I think Taekwondo and being part of a team really turned things around for you. Yeah. Um, it was kind of a bit of a random thing, wasn't it? Trying something else to take over from the swimming. Just because I liked anime uh, at that, that Yeah, that you time. did. You went into because your special interest has always been sort of um, Japanese Pokemon, Yu Gi Oh! Yeah, yeah. Japanese. And you went to your secondary school because they did an exchange. Mm-hmm. And you actually went on the exchange, didn't you? Yeah, and to you Japan, enjoyed yeah. it. And that was amazing. It, it was, was around like, the time oh, that. that, that mm-hmm. um, Fukushima incident happened, wasn't that? Yeah, so it was, it was yeah. we were having an exchange student, uh, exchange mm-hmm. program with the mm-hmm. school in Fukushima, and it was um, it's a bit hard. It was it was a lot different to like mm-hmm. what was planned, but um, it was good. It was a good mm-hmm. experience for me. I I it was one of the only times that I really felt like accepted by a group for like a mm-hmm. in, in a long time because mm-hmm. the Japanese students they were like really impressed with like my academic stuff and they're really impressed with my taekwondo i was like oh my god i just never get this like in my school and it was kind of like wow like they actually see me and they want to talk to me and it's like it was um i think that was the most that's how it should be isn't it? that was the most transformative thing for me and i was talking to um 
uh, someone recently about like this. I think I was talking to Timmy about the the mm. sort of how the American schools work versus British schools because mm. in like the American schools, like if you do well academically and you you're good at sports, you're like instantly just the popular person. Right. Yeah. 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 Whereas in in the in the UK, it's like not like that at all. No, no, it's not. So it's oh, the sometimes opposite. the opposite. Yeah. But I think you tied hot I mean, you tried a few kind of martial arts. Tied Aikido. And then they, yeah, you did judo. Tried. You tried karate. <laughs> and then eventually taekwondo and you just, that was it. You just took to it. Mm. And um, it kind of, um, the exercise and the routine and... Um, the formalities around it as well. was good because it kind of um, helped your mental health. But then, of course, you took it too far in terms of doing too much exercise. Even brushing your teeth, you'd be doing squats and kind of... Yeah, I was really obsessed with it. And also, there were certain weight categories you had to be in and lose weight for, and you lost a bit too much weight. And yeah. then, so that was a bit unhealthy. But all the... Um, but you faced a lot going into competitions and so forth. I'd have and like a lot of meltdowns and panic yeah, attacks meltdowns before. Meltdowns before, but then you would use mindfulness and kind of focus. And um, you were amazing. You've achieved so much, really. And yeah, you and you and, and Dad have been like amazing with like helping me get to like because they they're taekwondo clubs like the sport taekwondo clubs. Because I started like mm. a traditional one like around Harrogate, but yeah. then I then I think. You know, um, one of our friends kind of yeah. encouraged us to kind of go to a sports place, try it out. Yeah, they kind of headhunted did. me and, yeah. um, you know, started, started training there. We used to, like, travel back and forth after That's school. Three or four times a week. Yeah, two-hour round trip yeah. um, to train. Um, I don't know. Mm. I've, I felt like I kind of – I remember my secondary school as – secondary school experiences feeling kind of worthless like mm. people to really I didn't feel like people really saw me or found me interesting and mm. I I kind of I, I had like a some some kind of passion or ignition to make myself better like all the time mm. about in, in every setting that I wanted to like you know I I, I always had these goals because you know your goals and your meaning and the reason why you do things they're kind of separated from mm -hmm. how you feel like mm -hmm. if you're looking to be happy all the time it's not always something that you can do but you can always have a goal or a meaning that you you strive to do um and i think that's what taekwondo and what the academic stuff was about because i was like all right i'm going to prove myself that i'm you know i'm a, a good person <laughs> i am good at stuff and I, I kind of thought that, you know, when I started getting awards yeah. and medals that people would, um, I guess, want to talk to me more, mm. be more social. And that did happen within Taekwondo oh, it did, it did. Um, and with the, te with the, with the teachers, mm. like in the top mm. sets and stuff, but mm. not like with the kids at school. So I always just felt like you know, every time that I went to school, it was kind of like a right, this is a task and mm. you know, any time that I was actually in lessons or is in the library revising or researching, like I felt good, but then it was the stuff around it that I just couldn't cope with. And I tried to be social now and again. Um, I got involved in different groups, but I was very much like a drifter. Like I didn't really have like a, like a best friend or like someone that I could rely on or something that I could, mm you know, talk to about my feelings. Yeah, yeah. Um, which I think I found really difficult. There was nobody you could really trust, was there, at that no. point in terms of talking? No. I don't think. Not friends, no. not mm. people in my social circles. Mm -hmm. um, it was hard. It was a hard time, wasn't it? Really hard on you and uh, bittersweet. With all the taekwondo and the positive things and the traveling, so mm. you learned to be more independent because you were traveling to different countries and 
working with in Thailand, team, yeah. Working with a team and then that kind of set you up to kind of Oh with Taekwondo, think, yeah. yeah. I think we always kind of said we'll give it a go, Tom, you know, and then we did the prep around it, didn't we? And tried to kind of um find the best way to kind mm. of um support you to do those things, even though they're a challenge. And I think that was the good thing about you is you would always give it a go. Well, you I mean you, you taught me from a young age to give um, stuff a go and you know and we always said have your autism in your back pocket kind of thing if you need it, but don't say I can't do it because yeah. uh, just give it a go. You know, if you don't want to, you don't want to, but just try it. So it feels like a lot of a lot of parents, a lot of people mm. kind of go like to the two extremes. Mm. They're either like mm, maybe, they can't yeah. do anything, so we're not going to expose them to it. Mm. Or they're like they have to do everything that's expected of them and they have to do all these things. And if they don't do it, then that's a bad thing and that they should be punished or they should be, you know. Whereas with with you, you know, growing up with you as my mom, it was kind of like um, I, I was exposed to that stuff, but then if I needed to, I, I could exit and it wouldn't be like a an expectation or an issue that... I couldn't cope with it. I think that that that's the kind of dynamic that really works work for me because I still got the experience of it, but then I felt safe enough to exit if I. Because yeah, quite often we'll say to kids, right? If if we're going to commit to this, we're going to do it week after yeah, week. Week after week, you have to. Well, actually, it doesn't work with older. Maybe with my younger son, it did, but not with mm. you, Tom. Mm. So yeah, absolutely. But I also recognise that some parents will really struggle with their children with autism going to activities and doing things like that because you maybe you're on your own maybe your child has no sense of danger and that kind of thing and that yeah. is tricky so i do recognize you can't always do that with your children no but it's, it's about it's about the adjustments mm. though isn't it it that you is do. doing something that challenges them a little bit yeah bit by bit so but it's not support. so exposing that it just mm -hmm. causes them to mm -hmm. find life just an overwhelming yes. yeah because life is life and you have to have little tasters to know that actually i know how this is gonna go so the next time i do it whether i like it or not i know how predictable it's gonna mm. be and eventually i'll be able to cope with that because i know about that and that experience or that sensation and I can deal with it more so it kind of things get worse before they get better I guess and it's writing it down sometimes I hope you guys can hear me okay yeah. <laughs> you're doing great you're doing great it's an awful voice to listen to <laughs> for an hour and a half <laughs> well um I mean going a bit further because I know we were talking about how it was hard to to get me support like in an ideal world mm -hmm. what would you have wanted mm -hmm. for me or what 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 do you think would have been helpful either from the school or from mental health systems i would have wanted a coordinated team around you and us as a family mm -hmm. um that were trained in autism that were trained in sensory, were trained in mental health. Um, so it's not kind of one size fits all, but kind of mm. got had the chance to get to know you and, and kind of fed that back into school and into the family as well. So it was more joined up. Um, I think that would have worked better. And also, I think, which is really powerful and um uh, particularly in schools, is peer awareness. And, yes. Um, yeah. And other kids, and, you know, so you identify this child as being bullied for whatever reason and just giving them a voice or being their voice to say, actually, this is the reason why this is what you can do to help. This is what you could do to support and, and kind of turn it on its head a little bit. Mm. So, so that's, that's something else that I uh, found with my, my teaching as well. This is so powerful. But I've done in primary schools before with teachers. Um, the child has always become more powerful and kind of has a voice and is able to change things because 
whether or not they're able to tell their story and what they find difficult. If other children are aware, then they don't... It's kind of more... Uh, norm- I hate to use the word, but more normalised. And then yeah. it just becomes accepted, you know, and acceptance so we can ask for ultimately, mm. really. I think it would have been really good for me to have like a like an like a role model that was autistic that you know like when when I went into into schools and seeing the seeing the other the kids and stuff like there were no programs no films nothing no. there was Rain Man yeah wasn't there and that was it so everybody thought everybody that was autistic behaved like Rain Man and that's just not the case very stereotypical and um, but even just someone someone that I could who was older who you know, is doing stuff that that I wanted to do when I had their, you know, their their life like sorted and their adjustments sorted in in daily life, and just someone to like talk to about being autistic. I think would have been really helpful. But I think you know a lot of lot of autistic people, you know, we just have such a hard time in life. It's hard for us to get into those positions where we're able to to be active role models for for kids and. I think it's changing overall. I think it's there's... taken a while, that's it, but mm. I think it is changing. And I think um, uh, I think kids are kind of looking, you know, and finding their place easier, you know, because mm. of more diversity. But it's taken a long time coming, isn't it, really? Yeah. There's so much, like, work that needs to be done for, like, preparing, mm. like, autistic kids mm. for manipulation and bullying and mm. i don't know exactly how the best way to go about doing mm. that is but i think it just it definitely needs to be mm. tackled because we we know that like long-term anxiety in formative years mm. leads to development of depression mm. and mental it does, health it does, it um does. you know it's it's something that really needs to be tackled and i think that that bullying and social mm. isolation and the mm. sensory elements the social elements at school the absolutely just it's so impactful on like someone's long-term mental health mm. you know it's it's something that can you know follow you into adult life you know if well to find every aspect of life scary is a really i can't imagine what that feels like really to just find everything and everyone and every sound and every feeling really mm. scary mm. um you're about to it's about to have an impact, isn't it, yeah. on your mental health and your well-being. So I think it's so important that we have that, not awareness. Because awareness is just that sort of lip service saying, oh, yeah, I know about autism, I've read a bit about it. Mm. It's about about doing something about it, actually being proactive and saying, look, you know, well, there's a kid over there or there's a mate over there. Or there's a kid over there that actually people are bullying or they're um, not being not being supported and actually just going, look, if you want to join in, you know, come and join in with us or be part of it. Mm. Or, um, our children, you people, have just got so much to offer as friends, as children, as, as colleagues, you know, and just so much to offer, really. Totally. But, yeah. Completely, just in awe sometimes. Really, I mean, I know, I know what we, we talked a little bit about uni and traveling and mm-hmm. um, taekwondo and stuff. But what did that? What did that feel? Feel mm-hmm. like? Because obviously, I was putting myself out in various different ways that you know they're quite anxiety provoking. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. what what were your like thoughts about about me doing? those things sort of in in the media and like what what how did you feel when I did those things and I, I actually succeeded and you know I went to the Commonwealth and I mm. got gold and I went to the nationals and I got gold and I represented my country like how did how did that feel for you well I was incredibly proud obviously I mean the, the Commonwealth was one of the most overwhelming times but the fact you got man of the man of the games as yeah, well. Yeah. You got the award for man of the games because of your humbleness and your sportsmanship and the way that you were so fair. 
just said everything to me about the nature of your character, which we were really proud of. And that's nothing to do with you being autistic or not autistic. That's to do with who you are as a person. So that was amazing, really. Um, I knew you were capable of going to uh, university, but I didn't think you would choose a city. I was surprised you're choosing a city. Like it's because of the, the programme, the industrial experience. I just, yeah, I found it when I was quite young, yeah. like... Like when I was looking at, I was looking mm. at unis before mm. it came to the point where I was doing my levels because mm. I was like, I want to. I was be a surprised, that, but I was surprised at choosing one just because it was so busy. So we kind of, because I remember the first time we went to visit the uni, you wouldn't, you didn't want to kind of go anywhere near it. Yeah. So we had like like a fifteen minute visit, didn't we? And then uh, we got back in the car and went home. And then the next time you kind of got out and went and looked around, we kind of did it very slowly. But you were so independent in seeking out your support that you needed at university. You got really good support, mm. didn't you? And, um, uh, yeah, it was tricky, wasn't it, in terms of deadlines and timetables and organisation, because we both know you're not. No. It's not like um, I, it's, I can do it, it's just that yeah, I don't can, leave yeah. myself enough energy to do it. I know, it so kind just, of takes a small part, doesn't it? Yeah. So, but you looked after yourself, you fed yourself, you shopped, you lived independently, and you learned to drive as well. You mm. learned to drive, but you don't like driving, do you? So, you haven't driven, but you learned to drive. You, um, Again, driving is so unpredictable, isn't it? Or other people are unpredictable. So the that noises was really and, hard and yeah. sensory, so that was really difficult. But yeah, you succeeded and then you went to Thailand, which was an even bigger thing, and that was like Did I tell hard. you about it before I did I just tell you that I'm going to Thailand? No, you tell me about it, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> obviously you told me that you'd applied for this uh, placement. Yeah, but I I just applied and then it's Yeah, you, you did, yeah, you it. did. Yeah. It was like how are we going to prepare for that? It's so, the same with getting like a tattoo and stuff as well. I just, I said, oh, hey, I've got yeah. a tattoo. <laughs> well, this was the guy that didn't like needles. Yeah. I want to go for injection. I didn't like, I don't like needles. <laughs> no. and, and, like you were having a, having a tattoo on your back, <laughs> which is gorgeous. But yeah, it was just, I think you've blown my mind with what you've achieved really, you know, and the things that you can do and you haven't let anything stop you. Or anyone really, you know, you've got it. I've always gone for like the yeah. the most difficult things as well, haven't I? Just you've always challenged yourself, yeah. which is great because it gets you out of your comfort zone. And um, and there's been the hardships that have come with that. We talked the other night about this roller coaster, so you have real highs, don't you? Yeah. But... And you you support me a lot with my like mental health and stuff because I I do get like. Mm-hmm. You know, I talk, I talk about it on the podcast quite a bit where I'm, you know, like, you know, although I appear and I talk well and I, mm-hmm. you know, seem to be producing loads of content all the time and doing all these mm-hmm. things, mm-hmm. like, but I'm not always like that. Yeah, I'm not always yeah. on top of things. Like, there's been lots of situations where I haven't been able to get out of bed for, like, months mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. you know, we'd, ha- we'd, we'd, we'd have to work up to me, like going outside mm. and like yeah, eating and... the eating and the, the mm. agoraphobia mm. and mm. you know i think i think there's there's still some things that i struggle with like i find the really difficult part of adult life is mm. managing friendships um that's something that's kind of come up you know i, I kind of come out my shell a bit and i've mm. yeah, um yeah. learned a bit more about you know you know, I, I'm good at making friends. It's mm-hmm. just the like the maintenance over the course of like the year mm-hmm. or something yeah. around like texts and setting up a, events and things to do that I find really difficult. Um, you don't like kind of the in between the small talk and things like that. You, no, you don't do that very well, do you? The, no. Um, but you've got a lovely, a lovely girlfriend, Jan. You've got some really good friends that have stuck with you and yeah. kind of you get them, they get you and mm. it just kind of works you know doesn't it 
And it's not like a, it, even like in any in any mm-hmm. relationship that I have, it's not mm-hmm. like they're de- they're doing it for me, like that. I I need to have this mm-hmm. friend, like because, and and it's a difficult mm-hmm. to be to be my friend. Like I I I offer a lot to other, other people in my life as well as you know being supportive. supportive. You're supportive to me as well, and I know you're supportive to the family, and I think um, I think. Uh, if there's one thing I could take away, it wouldn't be the autism, it would be the mental health difficulties. Yeah. I would just like yeah. to pluck that from you and just have you been on a level rather than you having to cope with the ups and downs. And that's hard to watch sometimes, but um, be very resilient. You always come back up again, and I think that's amazing. Mm. What you get? Stronger and stronger each time, I think. And then I go too far, and then I have a burnout. And... Yeah, you do. Yeah, I'm working on I'm it okay. though. Just... I'm working on you are. Yeah. relaxing, even though I find it very annoying. <laughs> I know. It's like I have a bath. No, I don't want a bath. <laughs> no, just um, it's hard for you to chill, isn't it? Yeah. 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 But I, th- I think that's also one of the reasons why I do well at things because I just yeah you're very focused, you're very focused, so... very single channels and focused. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's good. That's good in a lot of ways. It helped you. Mm. But I think um, I think a lot of like I wish I had that sometimes. <laughs> just it's a real skill. It's a real skill, isn't it? I think it's just because of like the the experiences that I've mm-hmm. had of mm-hmm. not being very good at something like taekwondo. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then working day and night and really hard over the course of years and then mm-hmm. succeeding i think mm-hmm. just like having that experience of going through that process has helped mm-hmm. me a lot with anything that i do mm-hmm. like i still i still get like you know annoyed at myself for not for not achieving mm-hmm. targets that i want to achieve on mm-hmm. in a certain time frame but mm-hmm. you know it's still you know i, I still still get disheartened and I'm like my confidence isn't mm. very good and I still yeah. feel not good because of my mental health but like I still have yeah I don't know there's just I, I still have like for some reason I managed to maintain mm. the, the mentality of just keeping going with stuff it's mm. it's a bit weird actually I don't know I don't know how but also I think the big difference is you talk about it now yeah. Whereas when Before, we lost you, yeah. you didn't talk, you were close, mm. but now you do talk to us. Um, and you do you do say, look, I'm not feeling great or I don't feel safe or yeah. we'll talk about it, which is absolutely amazing. And I think everybody that has mental health issues should be able to have a voice about it. They should be able to have somebody that they can actually say, look, mm. I'm not okay, you know. And we talk about a lot in in sort of modern society about mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know men mm-hmm. you know men have a difficulty mm-hmm. with opening up about things that they struggle with and mental health and stuff mm-hmm. um and I think it's really interesting that people kind of view openness and vulnerability as weakness yeah yeah it's a whereas strength. like it's, a it's it's the hardest thing to do mm-hmm. like it's yeah. not an easy thing to do and it's Absolutely. like people even you know it's 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 crazy. Yeah. I I feel like that's like one of the biggest lies that it's strong to ignore mm-hmm. your feelings and continue with mm-hmm. stuff because yeah, it just doesn't work long term and we see that reflected in like so. the the really bad ne- negative statistics about mm-hmm. men not seeking help and mm-hmm. you know ending their lives it's mm-hmm. one of the biggest contributors to it is, it is. to death um for autistic people mm-hmm. but also men under like something like the age of 40 or something it's crazy yeah. um it is something that i think needs to needs to we need to have a shift around but i think it is slowly mm-hmm. you know you have the push and pull of different mm-hmm. online spheres talking about different values and things but mm-hmm. um i'm hoping that you know we will get to a point where you know it's seen as a as a strength to talk about things should, should not, should and not be. not not a, a a plea for pity mm. or i think that's a big thing you know when i, when I comment 
yeah. cry for help. It's or like, t- it's I t- not a cry for help. I say, it's just... I tell some people I'm autistic. They're like, oh, I'm so sorry. And they're like, oh, <laughs> so what do, what do I have to do? And like, so you don't have to do anything. It's like, I'm not asking for support. I'm just telling you that I'm autistic. <laughs> so you know <laughs> or, that or pity. why I do particular things. Yeah. yeah. Or they're, they're That's just interesting. That's pity me. I'm and... so sorry. No, well, it just happens, you know. It's, it doesn't bother me. It's just like I just find it a bit, bit funny. It's yeah. like, uh, so, and then you say, say to someone, "Oh, my mental health's awful. I have mm-hmm. quite bad mental health conditions." Like, oh my god, like, it's like yeah, but you know, it's something that I've experienced for mm-hmm. up, upwards of ten, twelve years yeah. in my life. So it's, mm-hmm. it's not like, yeah, there's there's a big stigma around that as well. Mm-hmm. I think there is. There is. Definitely. Well, um, we've got one last question. I know that we've been recording for quite a while. You probably, we probably want to get off. I think and... we're probably sick of my squeaky voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, going to go for, go for a bit of a gym workout after, I think. Do, do some not. legs. I'm not. No, you're not. <laughs> I'm going for a gym workout. A gym. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess, I guess like... You know, obviously, we've touched on a lot of different things, um, mm-hmm. and I really want to end up with end up mm-hmm. end on something that's perhaps a um, bit more more akin to like learn, the, a learning experience for the people listening, and perhaps mm-hmm. something to take away. Um, but what a uh, message or, or lesson do you wish, or lessons that you wish um, parents would um, learn or incorporate into? You know how they how they view autism, how they support someone who's autistic, um, whether they're going for a diagnosis mm-hmm. process, mm-hmm. whether they're thinking about it, whether they are struggling with di- different aspects of of, of mm-hmm. being a parent of an autistic person. I think uh, one of the main things is have faith in what you know about your child. Mm-hmm. Uh, go with your gut and. Um, I think one of the main things is in terms of education. Yeah, the learning. The learning is a, is important, but make sure the school is also developing your child's social skills in a very structured way. In a safe way. Um, in a safe, structured way, because you might be doing it at home, but we know that. Our children with autism don't uh, generalise their skills across different environments. So they always, um, so teaching those skills in different environments is really important to generalise it. So make sure what you're doing at home, they're doing at school and vice versa. It's not just just context dependent things. Yeah, because I I see that because... I find, especially like talking to like my manager about like how I am on podcasts and social media and how I am sort of in work. It's like I I, I do just I don't necessarily transfer the skills that I have mm-hmm. outside of working t- into work and vice versa. Mm-hmm. Um. So I, yeah, I think that's that's a good point. I think. Um... Also, if there's anybody you can watch it, I've seen uh, Ros Blackburn, who's an mm. amazing woman with um, autism and very academic, and she's a great speaker. And one thing I always remember her saying, I only know what I'm taught, told or shown. Yeah. So don't assume that the child just picks things up automatically. Transient you learning. Talk. You have to teach it really literally, just like you do with the emotions and the emotion coaching. So just make sure that um, you've always got in your mind that just because she gave a really good example that she went to the seaside and um, she was um, she got some fish and chips and she was her carer was eating fish and chips with fingers and she was like. Oh, where's the knife and fork? So we eat with a knife and fork, mm, and they said, yeah. "Oh no, this is a finger day. It's a fish, it's a fish and chip finger day." And um, she said, "But I would never have known that because I had not been taught that in different settings." Mm. I thought, 
you only know what you're told, told or shown is a really key and really important message to remember for teachers and parents and anyone. Yeah, so I think that, that it's autism, we do tend to lack mm-hmm. that kind of mm-hmm. more transient learning with things. Like mm-hmm. we, we really need mm-hmm. to like it's have rules, it's it's even tangible. with exams. It's mm-hmm. like, I remember I was taught to do like loads of exam papers and I, I would always do mm-hmm. those exam mm-hmm. papers um it's a union stuff mm. and go through them and make loads of notes but because because the exam questions were different mm. it mm. didn't really make any difference because mm. i didn't know exactly what they were asking me to do yeah, yeah. i couldn't i couldn't just learn i i didn't sort of well, i wasn't able to pick up on cues of things that they were asking me to, mm-hmm. to know what exactly they wanted me to talk about. Mm-hmm. And I found that in situations where there was less of those essay questions and more of those like smaller questions, mm-hmm. you know, I, I aced them and those are easy, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. since it came to like the essay stuff, I just didn't know where to like, so where to start and what they were asking me. Mm-hmm. Like if they said, you know, yeah, you know, talk, you know, they'd ask a question like talk about inflammation in the body. Mm-hmm. I'm like, right. Okay. And in what sense, like, mm. do you want me to... It's not specific enough. In, information in diet mm. or culture? Or... Do I talk about <laughs> it? Do I talk about it or do I write? Oh, yeah. yeah well, or do yeah. I discuss? I, I think I got that one. Or do I discuss? You know, it's... How do I discuss difficult. something with myself? Like... <laughs> Whereas if they said, like, talk about the um, infl- inflammatory pathways that are related mm-hmm. to... Uh, the use of ibuprofen mm-hmm. um, and how that impacts nerves and how that impacts this mm-hmm. and this and that. And I'd be like, oh, cool. Awesome. Well, it's a boundary, a structure. Yeah. Well, and I just found that with exam mm-hmm. questions, I just write and write and write and write. I'd be like trying to pump mm-hmm. out words just mm-hmm. so that I'm touching on every single possible basis oh, yeah. around yeah. this this thing. And it, well, it obviously worked. It just, you're probably exhausted afterwards. So, yeah. I mean, it could have been a lot better if they were more specific, but mm-hmm. again, that's not that's uh, not something to bear in mind. Isn't it's not it? an adjustment. Oh. We just get more time. Yeah. You know, it's that needs to change definitely the education system, mm-hmm. right? Around those does. questions, hmm. um, mm. make them more visual as well. Make mm. them more visual. <laughs> I think that's quite important, isn't it? <laughs> Well, um, physical awareness, anyway. Yeah. Awareness. Yeah. Well, we, we've touched on a lot of different aspects, and we have. I've squeaked my way through. You squeaked your way through. <laughs> <laughs> um, you were very nervous at the start, weren't you? you know? Obviously, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> it's not I my just, natural habitat. No, so. no, I, su- I suppose not. Um, but as as with all podcasts, it tends to be like first 10, 20 minutes, it's a bit anxiety provoking, then you get used to it. Yeah. Is that it feels it's not with you it helps. Yeah. <laughs> if you're a stranger, it won't be worse. I suppose so, yeah. Yeah. I suppose so. But I really appreciate you you coming on to the pod mm-hmm. to um I guess talk about my 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 life from a different angle. Mm-hmm. Um I hope that you guys have found it useful to I guess hear more about the things that I talk about on a regular basis mm-hmm. within the podcast from you know someone who's experienced it from that different angle that different mm-hmm. um I'm trying to think of another way to say angle but I think that's perspective. that's probably perspective <laughs> there you go um but yeah um thank you so much have you um I want to ask you a question have you enjoyed mm-hmm. your 40 40 podcast experience. I have, most definitely. <laughs> most definitely. I've actually, it's been good. Yeah? Yeah. Good. Good. I hope there's lots of people watch it. And yeah. Yeah. I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will. Yeah. Um, so usually when when we finish up around about the end of the podcast, mm-hmm. we'll do um, what's called song of the day. Um, and I didn't ask I didn't ask you to think of a song because it was kind of right. like a last minute okay. podcast. Right. I remember I can edit stuff, so it's, okay. you know you can think about okay. what you don't want to say. But usually uh, we'd go for a song that either means a lot to you, something that you like, 
or something mm-hmm. that I guess is related to the topic of the podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, is there anything that okay. kind of springs to mind that? So there is. There's pink uh, perfect. Ah, pink perfect. And if you're watching Pink, I'd love tickets. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a <laughs> regular listener of the podcast, Pink. <laughs> there are a few uh, swear words in it, though. No, so. <laughs> yeah. Is it is it the F in perfect? I think there's a, another version, isn't there? Without the... Uh, no? I think radio edit. The radio edit. F yeah. in perfect, radio edit. Yeah. No, we'll put the explicit one in. Oh, sorry, everybody. <laughs> I don't think I've actually heard about that. I heard that one before. Um, where is my playlist? Uh, there we go. So that will be added to the um, Song of the Day playlist, which is always down at the bottom of the description if you want to check that out. It's a compilation of all of my guests' uh, songs from season two. Um, songs that mean something to them, some songs that are related to the topic of the podcast that we talk about. Mm-hmm. Really highly recommend you go check that out. Um, see all the range of different tastes in music and and, su- and such. Um, but yeah, if you have enjoyed this this episode of the 40 Oti podcast and you want to show some love, um, I'd always point you to uh, like, subscribe, do all of that youtube stuff. And if you are listening to this podcast on like Spotify or Apple Co- Podcasts or Am- Amazon, I think, that's something that I've done, Mm-hmm. audible <laughs> give it a rating that will um help me a lot with getting this podcast more out to people who will find it useful and find it something um find it transformative and, and help them out with their autism journey mm-hmm. um and if you want to stay up to date with my life the things that i do go over onto my instagram at thomas henley uk i do have different social media platforms that i'm under the same name on but instagram definitely is the place to go if you're looking for daily blogs reels videos um updates on my life that is the place that i usually reside um and yeah if you are looking to talk to me if you want if you want to book me for a um personal consultancy session coaching whatever you want to call it um my link's always down in the description under all my links uh, you can see like a link tree. You'll be able to see like all the stuff that I do and mm-hmm. get forwarded to any of those things that I've mentioned. Um, and yeah, I won't ask you for any links because I know that you, <laughs> you're not a social media person. But um, I yeah. just watch you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if you've got love. if you've got any questions for for uh, my mom for Michelle, um, just mm-hmm. send me an email. Um, hi at Thomas and the UK. I'll get them over to her and. and uh, be able to reply to that um, absolutely if i can be of any help is there anybody out there yeah, just drop us a line yeah you, you probably you're probably going to get that because there might be quite a lot of people um asking, <laughs> you, <laughs> asking you about that. um but yeah i hope you have enjoyed this this episode once again and um stay tuned for the next one next week uh monday try to get out about 1 p.m on the um spotify and apple and all that uh, about 5 p.m over on youtube if you want to watch some shorter versions of the podcast some of the clips i do uh, head over to youtube and um yeah that's all from me rambling my head off at the end of a very long conversation with my <laughs> lovely mother um yeah uh, thank you so much for coming You're on welcome. to speak mom and You're um <laughs> no problem i've enjoyed it yeah. thanks all righty see you <laughs> okay, later guys bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.